For our Bible readings today, a little bit later, Pastor Kevin will be over. He'll read the gospel lesson, but he's also going to connect it uh, with this first reading from Ecclesiastes, and he's going to connect it in a way that's kind of opposite of what Ecclesiastes says. Because in this book, in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, the main writer is referred to as the teacher. And uh, he writes the book really kind of like an atheist. He looks around the world, uh, he sees everything that's in life, and he says everything is meaningless. And step by step, he shows how a life without God and without knowledge of God makes all of our work, our pleasure, and our pain meaningless and hopeless. So here is the reading from the first and second chapter of Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I, the teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on humankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things that I toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yep. They will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This, too, is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun, for a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave it all that they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under, their sun, under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain, and even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. And may we indeed see our Lord as he comes to us now in our gospel reading from the 12th chapter of the book of Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, be watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And then he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. So why do you get up in the morning? Well, aside from your bladder telling you you better make a beeline to the john before your bed gets all wet, why do you get up in the morning? Why do you get up and eat and drink? Why do you head out for work or school or play? What drives you to engage in the activities you engage in? I mean, are you doing it because someone has told you that this is just what you need to do to get through life? Are you doing it because you're trying to survive? 
Are you working and slaving to make it to the weekend so that you can relax for just a little while and then extending that a, a little bit longer into later years and, and working to save up enough money so that you can re eventually retire and enjoy what time you might have left before you die? Why do you get up in the morning? What are you living for? What gives your life purpose and meaning? And believe me, I'm not asking these questions because I'm trying to be a pain in the rear. And, and neither am I trying to overload your brain circuits. I'm asking these questions because a majority of people in the U.S. are asking them as well. According to articles in the Christian Headlines and LifeWay Research, just a year ago, 57% of all Americans were looking for more meaning and purpose in their lives. 57%. That's not a small number. And that number means that you and I are constantly rubbing elbows with others who are looking for meaning and purpose. They might, may not be telling us about it, but it's there. They are wondering, questioning, and trying to figure things out. And the Christian faith actually speaks profoundly towards this matter. So it's my hope today that in this sermon I can give you some tools. First, if you are seeking meaning and purpose in your life, I'm going to invite you to explore the Christian path and to show how it is different from other paths. And then secondly, if you do have meaning and purpose, I'm going to try to give you some tools to engage others who are struggling, to equip you so that you may lead others down the path that goes to abundant life. It's a tall order, so I've kept my introduction short. Maybe my sermon will be a little bit shorter this time too. Let's pray. I don't care who you are, that was funny. <laughs> Gracious God, we know that many seek meaning and purpose in life. We know that some even have trouble finding a reason to get out of bed. Shine your light into their midst so that they may see what you have in store for them, and that when they place their trust in you, they may have confidence that all they do and everything they experience has meaning and then having meaning and purpose in life, they may face whatever road they travel with confidence and with peace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We begin with that Ecclesiastes text this morning. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And not just meaningless. Utterly meaningless. Meaningless. I bet you never thought you'd hear that from the Bible, did you? I mean, I mean, really, does the Bible say that everything is meaningless? Well, really, no. And, and, and the reason for that is, is you have to understand the book of Ecclesiastes is written actually by scholars think two authors. One author who is kind of looking through the lens of atheism, and then an author at the very end who looks at it through the lens of a believer in God. And the majority of the book is written by uh, the person who is looking from the atheistic point of view. And after looking and considering all things, looking at it from the atheistic point of view, the author says, everything is meaningless. If there is nothing, if there is nothing beyond this life, if there is nothing beyond this universe then all is vanity. Nothing has any meaning whatsoever. And you see, thousands of years later, atheists are actually still coming to the same conclusion. Uh, Richard Dawkins, who is a very, very famous biologist and atheist, wrote the following in his book, River Out of Eden, A Darwinian View of Life. He wrote, In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. End quote. 
Now, from an atheist perspective, you actually have to just think about it in this way, and this is kind of what Richard Dawkins is bringing up. You know, basically in about four to four and a half billion years, our sun will begin running out of fuel, and it will begin expanding. And at that point in time, the earth will be burned up to a crisp. Everything on the earth will vanish and cease to exist. And honestly, nothing will matter at that point. Nothing. It'll, it'll, it'll be taken away. I mean, if there's nothing beyond this physical universe, and if we don't manage to figure out a way to, to go to another planet, then nothing matters. Burn up now, burn up four and a half billion years to go, years from now, same result. How do you find that idea? Most of us find it revolting. Most of us cannot stand the thought that our lives have no meaning or no purpose. And even Richard Dawkins understands this. And why do I say that? Because I've watched quite a few videos of him giving presentations and, and interacting with uh, Christians. And, and oftentimes he'll take a quick Q&A at the end of his, of his uh, debates and stuff. And inevitably someone will come up and ask him, is there meaning and purpose to life? And Richard answers almost exactly the same every time. He will look at the person and say, that's a meaningless question. And that's right. From an atheist perspective, that is a meaningless question. But why doesn't he just come out and say, no, there's no meaning. There is no purpose to life. Why? Because we need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. And, and even other atheists have agreed with that, like the, the atheist philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, who said this, he who has a why can bear almost any how. So you, you, you need a why so that you can bear the hows of life. And so then there, there are those who, who begin tracking down that path, and then they'll say, okay, so, so therefore it is up to us to create our own meaning and purpose in life. And that is filled with several problems. And the first problem is this. It doesn't get you out of the atheist dilemma. You can create any purpose you want to, but ultimately you will still come face to face with meaninglessness. Ultimately, whatever you perceive that you have accomplished is going to vanish after you die. I mean, in a very real way, if you create your own purpose and meaning, you are living under a delusion that your life matters. When in reality, it's going to make very, very little impact in the world at all. That's just the first problem. Second problem is one of relationship. It's a problem of ego. So what if my purpose is seemingly healthy for me, but it has an adverse effect on others? What if I decide that my purpose is to become the most powerful person that I can be in, in business or politics or what have you, and it doesn't matter what I have to do to get there. It doesn't matter who I have to step on as I climb up that ladder. It's my purpose. It gives me meaning. So who cares what it does to others? And you cannot tell me that looking at the world right now that that problem is not already a reality. And the last problem with creating your own meaning and purpose is highlighted by our gospel lesson. I bet you were wondering if I was actually going to get to that today, weren't you? Maybe not. Who knows? Anyway, I got to it. Finally, we get there. It just took a little little while. Um, Jesus is teaching someone from the crowd. And, and, And the crowd yells out, you know, one from the person says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But Jesus looks at him and he says, friend, you know, who appointed me to be a judge or arbiter over you? See, what's going on here is that in that day and age, people would oftentimes go to rabbis and ask rabbis to settle disputes of the law, particularly within families. But Jesus says he's not going to do that. Not in this instance. He doesn't want to do that for two reasons. Number one, um, Jesus already knows what is in the Old Testament law when it comes to dividing properties. And so he's not going to try to go against the Old Testament law. And the other reason he does not want to enter into this conversation is that he senses what is at the heart of the matter. And at the heart of the matter, Jesus senses greed. And that's why he continues. Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life 
does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, there's something interesting that is going on in Jesus' comment here. Because there, in the Greek, there are three different words that could be used for life in this statement. And the first Greek word that could be used is bios. And bios is biological life and the things that we need to maintain it. Uh, food and shelter and money, uh, work, etc., etc. Jesus doesn't use that word. And the other possibility of words that he could have used is psyche. That's the second Greek term that could have been used. And psyche consists of all the things that make you, you. Oftentimes the word is translated soul or self. It's your identity. It's your very being. But Jesus doesn't use that word. The third and final Greek word that Jesus does use is zoe. Now zoe refers to the quintessential life which means a life that is meaningful, a life that is abundant, filled with purpose and meaning. And that kind of life, abundant life, meaningful, purposeful life, does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Now, I, I guarantee you that in Jesus' day, <clears throat> and even today, you know, there's going to be some folks scratching their heads at that one, but Jesus doesn't back down. He illustrates that point with a parable. He says that the ground of a rich man produced abundantly. Now, now notice here that it's the ground that produces. It's not the man himself. He doesn't the one that, that produces. He's not the one who does the work. It is the ground. He's given a gift, something that he did not earn. Like if any one of us would have won that billion dollars in the mega millions last night. Anybody not going back to work tomorrow? No, I didn't think so. Yeah, him. But you luck into it. But what is his reaction to this luck? What is his reaction to the windfall? Verse 17, and he thought to himself. To himself. What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then he says, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Now, one of my commentaries pointed out that these verses are the most self-referential verses in all of the scriptures. There are more references to me and I and self condensed into these three verses than any other verses in the Bible. The guy is ultimately pleased with himself. There is no consideration of others. He swelled up, puffed up, thanks nothing of anybody else. He's selfish, conceited, self-centered. But before we rag on this guy too hard, let me point this out. Isn't this what we dream of? I mean, let's be honest. How many of us seek to work and save so that we can get to that point, so we have enough saved up, so that we can retire, enjoy life, eat, drink, and be merry? Come on, be honest. Some of you are already there, and I'm jealous. And the rest of us are dreaming of getting there. I mean, this is what we want. This is what we crave. It's what we oftentimes sacrifice and save for. But what does Jesus say about it? Verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life is being demanded of you. All of the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? In other words, this night you're going to die. And what's going to happen to all this wealth that you have acquired What's going to happen to all of your barns? What's going to happen to your windfall? You have thought only of itself, and now it's all gone. You lived your whole life seeking to satisfy yourself, and now what? What kind of abundant life did you have? What kind of joy did you have? What kind of peace did you have? Nothing. Not a bit. You chased after things that did not matter and did not satisfy. 
And then Jesus finishes up with this statement. So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich towards God. And with that, Jesus takes us to the third option of how we find meaning and purpose. It's not saying there is no meaning and purpose. It's not creating your own meaning and purpose. But it's finding meaning and purpose in God. In trusting that there is someone, and in Christian terms, something, trusting there is something, but in Christian terms, it is believing that there is someone beyond this physical universe, that our lives go on after we die, and that our actions have eternal consequences. The thing about it is, I cannot prove that to you scientifically. I cannot prove it with absolute certainty that that is a reality, but I can tell you there are plenty of hints and clues that when you put them all together, I think give you a pretty solid answer that yes, there is a God and there is something that exists beyond this world. But if I were to go into all of that, this sermon would last forever. And some of you might already think this sermon is lasting forever. I get it, okay. Hang with me for just a little bit longer as I wrap it up. Because it all comes together. From a Christian worldview, we believe that our actions have consequences, both for good and for the bad. And as I mentioned earlier, our tendency is to think about ourselves and long for wealth and possessions in the day that we can tell ourselves to sit back, relax, eat, drink, be merry, enjoy life. And this tendency towards selfishness leads us (laughs) almost all the time to reject God and try to take command of our own lives, to be our own boss, to set our own meaning and purpose. But inevitably that leads to failure. Either we fail to achieve our own meaning and purpose or we achieve it and find that it didn't satisfy, or we die never really getting to enjoy what we work so hard to accomplish. And Christianity says that the reason for this is that there is a power that is working on us to corrupt us, to corrupt our actions, to corrupt our hearts. And that power is the power of sin. We are sinful and there is a power that continues to warp our hearts and minds and corrupt what we say and do. But... But God has acted. God has acted in human history to defeat and to forgive sin. God has acted through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus to change our hearts and to fill them with a love beyond measure. A love that seeks God and God's good and gracious will in all things. A love that leads me to submit my will and desire to God's will and desire. And it's a love that actually leads me to a different set of hungers and desires. And the main thing that I long for and hunger for is to be rich in God, as Jesus said. Which, which means to know God, to walk with God, to be filled with God. And, and the thing that the scriptures tell us is that you know, when God sees a heart that longs for him, when, when God sees a heart that yearns for, for God's love and grace and mercy, then God pours himself willingly into that person, right into that heart. God gives his very self to us to make our hearts full and overflowing, that we may have abundant life. And all of it happens through sheer grace. It's not by our own actions. It's a gift, freely given. And and, and you begin to experience it the moment you stop relying on yourself and trying to do, but then instead rely on God and understand that it is done. God's already given you everything you ever need. And he's given you the greatest gift that you could ever want or desire. He has given himself to you. Which means you have blessing upon blessing. You have grace upon grace. So what is left to do? To share. To share the love that God has so graciously poured into you. To share that love with others. 
to seek God's will above all things, to, to love God and neighbor to the best of your ability every day of your life, to share the gospel with reckless abandon and far, far from meaningless. When you live a life in God, everything, Everything is meaningful. And that's worth getting out of bed for. Amen?